Take your Bible this morning, turn to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2. We have been uh, looking at how Jesus treated his mother. We've been doing a series of messages on the women in Jesus' life. And so we're looking at that relationship with Jesus and Mary. And uh, we've been looking at what was his attitude. What, what was his treatment toward Mary? We're looking for those answers in these messages. And, of course, in the last message, we spoke about Jesus' trip with his parents to go to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. This feast was celebrated every year. Now, Jesus is 12 years old in the story, okay? After the weekly celebration in Jerusalem, uh, after it was over, they headed back home to Nazareth. Uh, Jesus, however, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't realize it because the men usually stayed at the back of the caravan and the women and the children stayed in the front while traveling. So they assumed that Jesus was with the other travelers, friends, or even with the other parent. So after a day's journey, which was about 20 miles, they stopped to rest for the night in the caravan camp. And after they arrived, the question that popped up quickly as the sun began to set in the, west, the western horizon was, where's Jesus? Joseph, do you know where Jesus is? No, I thought he was with you, Mary. Well, the FBI, Family Bureau of Investigation launched into search mode at Ford Mustang speed, okay? They began a frantic search in the camp for Jesus among family or friends, asking the same question over and over again. Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Do you know where he is? Where he is? And I'm sure that the negative answers escalated the stress level and blood pressure in their lives, making them frantic. So they probably did not sleep well that night at all. So what happened next? That's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's pray and we'll get into it. Father, again, thank you for the morning. Now, Lord, help us to glean the lessons that are found right here in this story about losing Jesus here in the trip back home to, to Nazareth. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to take the lessons and put them in our, into practice in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, look at Luke chapter 2, look at verse 45. We see the concern of Joseph and Mary. Verse 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. So when Mary and Joseph could not locate Jesus, they, they went back to Jerusalem. Uh, they have lost their son. Uh, they were already one day away, one day out from Jerusalem. So it took another day to get back to Jerusalem and another day of searching in the city to find Jesus. Uh, this was an added expense for Mary and Joseph to make this trip back. Now, there is a great truth right here, smack dab right here. When we leave the Lord behind or out of our lives, we waste our time and we waste our lives. There is a price for not having a walk with God or close fellowship with the Lord. You pay a price when you start drifting away from the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just going to happen. Mary and Joseph, they were distracted and they accidentally left the Lord in Jerusalem. Uh, they are not distracted now. They are intently focused in finding Jesus. Well, there's another truth here that's hidden. And uh, it's this, is... We find the Lord in the place where we left him. 
In other words, restoring your relationship with God and doing His will takes place at the place where you got out of His will. If you've gotten out of the will of God in your life, if you're going to get back in His will, you need to deal with the issue that got you out of the will. Many Christians get away from God because they will not submit to God's commands in the Scripture. They rebel or they refuse to obey a certain command or a certain Bible principle. Their rebellion leads to spiritual hardness and coldness because they are disobedient. Now my question is this, does this describe you right now? Are you getting frosty? You getting cold in your Christian life? Uh, have you cool, have you cooled off spiritually this last year? Think about it. Restoring your walk with God involves submission to the Lord in the area where you disobeyed him. When we look at Jonah, we find he got out of God's will when he refused to go to Nineveh. That's where God wanted him to go. He got back in the will of God when he submitted to the Lord and made his way back to, jo to, to Nineveh. In fact, Jonah chapter 3 verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Thank God for second chances. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it in the preaching I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of of the Lord. Now, if you are out of the will of God in your life, then return to the place or area where you left Him. If you need to submit to one of God's commands, repent of your rebellion and obey God's Word. If there is a sinful habit that you need to forsake, then flush it from your life. If you need to get right with someone that you have wronged, uh, then seek their forgiveness. <laughs> You're going to have to examine your own life. And the Lord, by the way, Lord, He's really good about whispering to us what we need to do. Okay? So be listening to what He says, what He's prompting you to do. But it's so hard. Yeah, it is hard. That's why we need to be careful not to mess up. But if we do mess up, God gives us the grace to correct our boo-boos and, and to make things right with Him and to make things right with other people. Well, we see a fourth thing here. Look at Luke 2, 47. We see the consternation of the crowd. Luke 2, 47. And all that heard him, they're talking about Jesus now, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son! Why hast thou thus dealt with us? Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So from verse 46, we find that when they finally found Jesus, he was in the Jewish temple sitting in a position of honor. He was in the midst of the teachers. The Bible says doctors. These are, are the teachers of that day. These guys were listening and asking, uh, asking questions, and Jesus was listening and asking them questions. And we find him in this place all throughout the Bible. The middle position, the center position, reminds us of the fact that Christ should be at the center of our lives too. He is to be the bullseye or the focus of our heart. It also reminds us that He is our mediator between God and man. He's the mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we see the consternation of the teachers here as they were astonished. They were amazed and also confused at the wisdom and the understanding of Jesus. And they probably were thinking, this is just a 12-year-old kid, and he knows so much. But they were focused on him. Why? 
because he's right smack dab in the middle. Everybody wanted to be around. Everyone wanted to hear him. Everybody wanted to ask questions. He's, they're focused on him. You know, that reminds us we need to be focused on him too. They were astonished. You know, that word astonished is the word existemi, which means this. That word astonished astonish means, means to throw into wonderment. To be beside oneself or to be amazed. That's the way the doctors felt. And it's interesting, it's in the imperfect tense, which means they were continually amazed over and over again. Man, I understand that. I'm amazed at the Lord every day in my life and everything for what He has done and the way He cares for me and answers my prayers. I'm amazed about that. Well, Mary and Joseph, they were also amazed when they saw Jesus in the temple. Now, the word describing them is the word ekleso, which means to be stricken with panic. So when they saw Jesus in the midst of the doctors, they panicked. They were stricken with panic. They were overwhelmed. They were shocked or amazed. They searched the city for their son and found him in the midst of the religious teachers and leaders. And they're probably going, I imagine Mary's probably going, ah! What is he doing? What is he doing? Well, <clears throat> Mary confronted Jesus. And she, she rebukes. She rebukes him. What are you doing? Have you, has your mom and dad ever asked that of you? What are you doing? I've heard that question many times in my life growing up. <clears throat> By the way, I've asked that question of my own ch children growing up. <laughs> what are you doing? Why have you done this to us? Why have you treated us this way? We have been worried sick looking for you. That's basically the flavor of what's going on here. In fact, that word sorrowing here reveals the nightmare that Mary and Joseph experienced. And uh, that word sorrowing has come from the word adunao, and it means to cause intense pain. To be tormented or distressed. To be in anguish. That's the way they felt. In fact, that word for sorrowing here is the same word used by the rich man in hell in Luke 16, 24. When he said he was tormented in these flames. For three days, I imagine that these parents did not sleep. Probably not at all. Each day their torment would increase. Where's my boy? Where's Jesus? Well, what we find here is an interesting situation. Mary, in essence, was blaming Jesus for her and Joseph's failure in leaving Jesus behind in Jerusalem. It was mama and daddy's fault. Mary is not alone, however, in blaming God for one's failures. Like Mary here, most people, most people, people, they frequently blame God for their own mistakes, their own troubles, and their own sorrows. I mean, many times God's the first one that's blamed. Mary and Joseph had no one to blame but themselves for their departure from Christ and leaving him behind. I mean, they should have double-checked double -check before they left. They had no legitimate excuse for leaving Jerusalem without, without their son. Their blunder was great, and they needed to acknowledge their own fault rather than dishonoring Jesus by blaming him for their mistake. Now, the same truth holds for, for, for us. Stop blaming God or other people for your mistakes. Take responsibility for your actions and decisions. It's not going to do you a bit of good to blame everybody else. You're not going to solve the problem that way. This is the key to turning your problems around and getting them corrected in your life. Take responsibility for your actions. Now, let me add another note here. If Mary scolded Jesus in front of everyone, which it kind of looks like that's what she did, it would have been humiliating and embarrassing. Listen, if you have to scold your child, try to do it in private. 
not in front of everybody else. Well, we see a fifth thing here. Look at verse 49, the concern of Jesus. And he said unto them, all right, the Lord's talking here. He's talking to mommy and daddy. How is it that you sought me? And wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? So we, we now find, here it is, this is the response. We find the response of Jesus toward his mom and his, his stepfather. What, what will he say? What well, will be his attitude? And notice right away the patience that he has with his parents. His folks left him behind. How would you feel if your folks left you behind for several days? How would you feel? You know, I remember when our kids were growing up, sometimes I would accidentally leave one of the child here back at the church when I went home after preaching. I tell you what, they were not happy campers, okay? And uh, I felt pretty bad also. Uh, well, that's what's happened here. But Jesus is not angry with them at all. Not at all. He was very patient with his mother and his father. And this is a good example for us to be patient with our mothers and fathers too, especially if they mess up. Well, Mary asked a question and Jesus answered with a question. She, Jesus responded to their blame by asking why they were looking for him since he was about his father's business. Now that statement right there proclaimed the entire ministry of Jesus and his purpose for coming into this world. That statement right there. Uh, doing God the Father's business was a must for Jesus. It was a priority for Jesus. And by the way, it should be our priority, too, to do the will of God in our life. Now, God's will for my life is going to be different than yours. But we should seek to know his will and then do his will. That should be our priority as believers. Matthew 6, says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Worshiping God the Father was important to Jesus as a child. He, his worship did not, however, involve disrespect or disobedience to his parents. Jesus tried to get across to Mary and Joseph that they should have understood what he was trying to do. But the parents did not grasp the significance of his words, my father's business. There's where, that's where some confusion was. Being about his father's business were the first recorded words of Jesus in Scripture. They set the pace for what we find throughout the rest of the Gospels. This was the focus of Jesus throughout his ministry. This is also the first mention of Jesus' awareness that he was God's son. This is the first incident. And even though Jesus knew his real father, he did not reject Mary, and he did not reject Joseph. So now we come to verse 50, the clouded minds of Joseph and Mary. Verse 50. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them, I must be about my father's business. They were confused about the Lord, what the Lord was trying to say to them. They did not understand that statement. <clears throat> These parents did not comprehend the fact that Jesus was making a distinction between his earthly father and his heavenly father. Although Joseph and Mary knew, they knew he was the son of God, they did not understand what his mission would involve. All they knew was they had to raise Jesus along with his brothers and sisters as a normal child. They were, they were to take care of the Lord. They knew that Jesus was special, but they did not know what was going on in his heart. And many Christians, they find themselves with clouded minds when it comes to understanding the Word of God or the will of God for their lives. Sometimes there's confusion there. 
Part of the problem is they are moving so fast through life that they fail to slow down and spend time with the Lord and listen to Him. Folks, man, if you're moving through life and you don't have time for Jesus in your life during the day, you're moving too fast. You need to have time set aside each day for the Savior. It needs to be in your life. But I'm busy, then you're too busy. When you're that busy that you can't talk to the Son of God who died on the cross for your sins, died and, and was buried and raised again and, and taken care of you and answering your prayers, got a home in heaven for you and he's coming back for you, if you're too busy for him, you're too busy. You know, in his book, Faith That Endures, Ronald Boyd Macmillan tells the story of a number of conversations that he had with a guy named Wang McDowell, Wang McDowell, one of China's most famous church pastors of the last century. The first time he met this famous and persecuted Chinese pastor, they had the following conversation and interchange. And here's what went on. Wang asked, young man, how do you Walk with God. That's quite a question. He said, I listed off a set of disciplines such as Bible study and prayer to which he mischievously retorted, wrong answer. To walk with God, you must go at walking pace. The words of Wang McDowell touched me to the core, he said. How can I talk about the Christian life as walking with God when I so often live it in a sprint. Jesus is inviting me to walk with him. So Ronald acknowledged that too often he found himself rushing here and there, rushing through life, scurrying through life, and just not slowing down his pace to walk with the Lord. Now the question is, does that describe you this morning? Are you going so fast that you can't walk with him? Well, on another visit, Boyd McMillan asked Wayne McDowell about his 20-year imprisonment for proclaiming Jesus Christ in China. That cell became a place of unchosen, hurried time for McDowell. There was nothing to do but to be in God's presence which he discovered was actually everything that he needed in that prison cell. When you find yourself left with nothing, you will find that God is enough. And that's what Ming Dao found out. Ronald summarizes what he learned from, him, from Wang Ming Dao. He said one of the keys to faith of the suffering church is God does things slowly. He works with the heart. We are too quick. We have so much to do, so much, in fact, we never really commune with God as He intended when He created Eden, the perfect fellowship garden. For Wang Ming Dao, persecution or the cell in which he found himself was the place where he returned to walking pace, slowing down, stilling himself enough to commune and fellowship properly with God. That's what took place in that cell. Oh, never underestimate the presence of the Lord in your life and walking with Him. You know, I think about Moses. God gave him instructions to lead the children of, Is uh, lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses wondered, how am I going to get them out? How am I going to provide for these people? How am I going to protect these people from enemies? And God says, God says, I'll take care of it. And Moses told him, he said, now listen, Lord, if we go, you've got to come with us. If you're not going to come with us, if we don't have your presence, then we'll stay in Egypt as slaves. Uh, 
if, if you let us go and go everywhere you want us to go, but you're not going to be with us, we don't want that. We want you with us wherever we go. Never take for granted the specialness of the presence of the Lord in your life and that walk with Him. You know, I think about David. David did the same thing. After David committed immorality and confessed his sin to the Lord, there in Psalm 51, uh, he said this. He, at, he said, one thing I desire of you, Lord, in Psalm 51. Well, what was it that he desired so bad? Well, he did not say, Lord, I desire my crown. Lord, don't take your crown away. He didn't say that. Uh, Lord, uh, don't take away my army. Lord, I want that. No, he didn't ask that for you. He asked that either. Lord, don't take away my kingdom. Don't take that away. No. Here's what he said. Lord, this is what I desire. Don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. David knew the value of the presence of God in his life. The Holy Spirit worked different in the Old Testament. It would come and go out of people. But in the New Testament, when the Spirit of God comes into the life of the believer, He stays. He doesn't leave. He stays. But you know what? If you're not careful, you can grieve the Lord. You can quench the Spirit by attitudes and actions that hurt Him. And you can find yourself distancing yourself from the closeness with God in your life. That relationship gets strained. Oh, don't let that happen in your life. Man, walk with God and know His presence each day. Spend time with Him. Spend time with the Spirit of God in your life. I mean, start. you know, when you talk to Him, the first thing you ought to do is just thank Him. Amen. Thank Him. Thank Him for all the things you've done. I don't care if you're 10, 15, 55, or 105 in here. Listen, you can thank God for all His blessings. You can tell Him how wonderful He is. You can thank Him for answered prayer. I mean, you know what? That'll take a while. And then the needs or things that you have in your life, then talk to them about that. You can do that every day no matter how old you are. You have a lot to thank the Lord about. Don't throw away the presence of God in your life as far as, as, far as quenching Him and resisting Him. Uh, stay close to the Lord in your relationship with Him. And if you don't know Christ is your Savior... You can ask Him to come into your life today. Right now, the, the presence of God is, does not indwell you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit does not live within. But when you ask Christ to come into your heart to forgive you and cleanse you of your sin, and when you ask or trust Him for eternal life, the Bible says He will come into your heart and save your soul, cleanse you of your sin. He'll forgive you. He'll, he'll prepare a home in heaven for you. He'll give you His gift of eternal life. And when He comes back, He'll be coming back for you too. Hallelujah. Those are great promises. So if you don't know Him today as your Savior, put your faith in Him today. Let's pray.